Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Anna Romandash. I'm from Digital Communication Network. Uh, we connect media, journalists, tech, and entrepreneurs. And I'm super excited to be here and present my amazing speakers and a very topical panel. So I know we're the only ones keeping you from the coffee break. So I promise you it will be interesting. So please ask us questions. There will be uh, a time for Q&A. So my speakers uh, represent big media organizations. My first speaker is Olga Malchevska here. Uh, Olga is a multimedia producer at BBC Russian Service. Previously, she has worked at BBC Ukrainian, uh, as a BBC Ukrainian desk editor. Uh, before joining BBC, Olga was awarded Václav Havel Fellowship for Outstanding Journalist representing Ukraine in Prague and Washington, D.C. Olga is the author of Kremlin Czech uh, Friends, an investigative documentary. It was a project of uh, Radio Free Europe uh, in cooperation with One Plus One Media. And previously she was a correspondent for One Plus One uh, TV channel in Ukraine. And Nick Shitko in the middle there. Uh, he's from the current time, Nastayashie Vremya, uh, a Prague-based Russian language TV channel, and his team is doing outstanding work informing audiences in Russian-speaking countries, creating an alternative to biased media with the use of digital technologies. He oversees production of different types of content with special focus on social media. So my speakers today uh, will be talking about the digital transformation in the newsrooms, and I think we will start with Olga. Olga, my question for you is, can you tell me how digital tools shape your work at BBC? Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for to organize this, for inviting here, and it's a great pleasure for me to be here to, to talk to you. And continuing to your question, well, first of all, I think that everybody can admit that now journalists cannot allow to each other, to themselves just to do their neural thing. And the, the main thing which shaped our work, my, my personal work, in uh, this digital transformation is that I cannot just write text or I cannot just make lives for television. I must do everything. I must edit video. I must make... Uh, text for social media or video for social media makes life lives also for social media and write text as well as it is a priority still. So everybody is doing everything and the, our work became more dynamic and uh, well of course I cannot speak about the old BBC organization, I can speak only about my work. But um, according to what we, we do we usually have different shifts and and uh, depending on a shift, you must do either write, either shoot, either edit, and uh, you must be ready to do it any time. Well, that probably is the main thing. And also, um, uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about the figures with BBC Russian because it, it's quite difficult to measure, but when I was, used to be a desk editor of BBC Ukraine and we measured our audience and we found out that around 40% of our audience comes from Facebook to us. So not from the main page of the website or from any other sources, but from the Facebook. So, and we understood it and we set it as a priority for us for a certain reason. And although it was quite unprecedented, we allowed ourselves to make some spe special pieces really only for Facebook. For instance, we could, we could do from the event only a Facebook Live and then our colleagues could follow up it and uh, to make a broader material for the website, let's say. But Facebook was really the first thing we did, if it is a breaking news, let's say. And also the same with Twitter, but Twitter in Ukraine doesn't have such such um, popularity as Facebook. And with BBC Russian as well, we, we also have this social media, not maybe priority, but of course we understand that depending on, on events, sometimes we must react more quickly with social media first, and then also to do a broader material for the web. It doesn't mean that we just post on Facebook and don't write breaking news or don't make it on air. Of course, if something happens before air or during the air, we must do it first on air and then our colleagues, or, or the best way is when it is made simultaneously. And uh, in this media transformation, I must admit that probably the main thing is a teamwork. So everybody, although 
everybody must be prepared to do everything. It is very, very vital to be sure and to rely on your colleagues and, and to know that in such a situation as breaking news, which happens every day, of course, you know that your colleague can, can give you a shoulder, let's say, and can, can do that part of your work. So it is not the environment of competition, but the environment of teamwork, of dedicated people who really can work, sometimes even not in the social hours and are able to stay longer. Although, of course, BBC tries to not to tolerate that, but of course, we understand as journalists, we must do it. But I will not keep your attention anymore and will pass to my colleague, Nick. So, yeah, the same question to you, Nick. Uh, you work for a relatively new organization, which focuses mainly on digital. So, what is digital to you, and how is it shaping what you do? Thank you, Anna. Thank you, Olga. It's my pleasure to be here. Great honor. Uh, and that's, that's a great question. For, for us at current time, uh, I like to view ourselves as a digital startup within, like, a huge media organization. And so for us, it meant that we were built, you know, like with digital f footprint from the ground up. So, uh, and I think that's th the most important thing, uh, how digital transformed our workflows. And it's, it's not even transformed, it just was built around that. That, uh, of course, we have like so many different digital platforms and we have a different story formats. And we need to have, first, we need to have people uh, who could uh, do, you know, videos, graphics, infographics, who can do social, who can do stories. And also we need to uh, be sure that these people know uh, the audiences and the platforms they're working for. Uh, now we see that, you know, the website is not a main platform anymore and it's been there for, for quite some time that, you know, like we, we are platform agnostic. We uh, focus on different platforms, social media, website, uh, mobile apps, etc. So I think that's uh, perhaps the most important thing uh, that an organization, any organization, not necessarily media organization, uh, I understand that a lot of you from NGOs and you, you guys also should think of, you know, when you're thinking about digital presence, uh, you, you want to make sure that you are are pervasive, uh, persuasive, pervasive and persuasive and you could get to whatever platform your potential audience is and make sure that they're engaged on this platform. And well, how to engage this audience uh, on, on different set of platforms, that's a great uh, question and probably a full-blown uh, topic for a huge discussion. That is a good question. I would like to ask it to Olga. How do you engage social, uh, how do you engage your audiences on social media and not only on social media? And how do you verify news also when working on social media and outside of it? Okay, thank you very much. That is actually the main question, how to verify it, because right, everybody of us has to work with social media and everybody know, speaks and knows a lot about fact-checking, but actually it is still the main problem how to do it. And in, in, my, in my work and what, what we do, is we at BBC and BBC Russian and Ukrainian, which or what we were doing in BBC Ukrainian as well, is of course we engage our audience, but it is always a trick for us, right? Because imagine the pressure on BBC. Everybody is looking, oh, you put a wrong comma, so BBC made a mistake, and everybody would be happy to make that screen everywhere. Look, BBC has a mistake. So we just cannot allow ourselves to do it. We have to verify, double check, and double check again. And of course, it is a speed which really makes us, how to say, of course, we want it to, to, do, to do it more quickly, but it cannot be our priority because our priority is to make it verified and to make everybody sure that if you write, if you read it from BBC, you will be exactly, you will have the information which is checked and double checked. And so what we do with our audience, we, we are happy to use user verified user-generated content, I apologize. But uh, still, uh, for instance, we had some very funny situations when, when people send video with dogs, cats, and you know, when, when, there was, when there was snow in April and people were posting photos with flowers, flowers and the snow. Of course, we, we, we made a 
kind of an action on Facebook and we wrote, well, if you have nice pictures, please feel free to send it to us and we will post the best of them. And we really did it. We, we published a photo gallery from pictures which were sent from different people. But even in that, let's say, simple situation when, when nobody can be damaged because it's just flowers and the snow, we have to double check it and how we do it. We usually ask that person that could you please send us some more pictures. Did you do it yourself? Yes, I do. Okay, so could you please send us more pictures from that set? So if the person sends, we can understand that probably yes, he or she will really doing those pictures themselves and nobody will then claim a copyright and ask BBC to pay thousands of dollars. Or when it is, but when it is a more complicated topic, like, for instance, shooting in Avdivka or shooting in Donbass, we have been even more careful, and it is always a challenge how to do it because we cannot penetrate there, right? We cannot, we cannot go to the other side of the front line. Unfortunately, because journalists are not allowed, foreign journalists, especially Ukrainian journalists, are not allowed to penetrate that zone, which is not controlled by Ukrainian government. So um, we have to, we, sometimes we have to use the content which is posted on Facebook. And for instance, we had such example last year, if you remember, there was a sharp violation of ceasefire, which obviously happens almost all the time, but it was a kind of a very sharp violation. And uh, the very much uh, of tightening in the beginning of February in Avdivka. And um, there was a, report of one of BBC journalists who was based in Kiev that time and he made a report about the front line and it, 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 it was planned to be a very, let's say, peaceful report about how people are handling there and how well they recover but then the situation became more tight and unexpectedly and he had to react and everybody, well, of course, had to react also and he had his stand-up uh, written and he had in the background of him there were Ukrainian tanks. So he didn't plan to say anything about Ukrainian position or, you know. But as those tanks appeared in the frame, Russian media responded immediately and Russian government and Ms. Zakharova made a screenshot, so how the pressure on BBC works, right? Immediately, seconds after his report, she made a screenshot of that stand-up and posted it on her Facebook with a question, what are Ukrainian tanks doing in Avdivka? Well, everybody knows that there was a violation of ceasefire. Everybody knows that heavy weapons were not tracked it out from both sides because it was actually, you know, a sharp phase of the conflict. But still, according to Minsk agreement, the, well, she pointed out that the tanks were not, not pulled out. And it was actually a problem because we had to respond and we had to contact in BBC, in Kiev, we had to contact Ukrainian uh, Minister of Defense for explanation what was Although it looked like everybody understood what was going on, as a BBC we had to verify. We contacted Ukrainian Minister of Defense to ask them for comments. Although we understood that probably they will not respond because it was like nine hours in the evening, but actually they did. And we wrote a material about, with their arguments, which stated that, well, you know, yes, it is a heavy weapon. It is not, if, if it is based there, it doesn't mean that it is being it is shooting, but it must stay there because it is the security of the people. And after that, the Russian reaction came immediately. So why I'm telling that, but you know, just a screenshot on the Facebook really caused lots of resonance because it was made by Ms. Zaharova and we had to react on that screenshot based on Facebook. So it means that social media is not only for fun now uh, so because authorities are also uh, very active on that social media and their posts and their comments on Facebook or on Twitter as well are also used as the official reaction. And after that, BBC Ukraine and BBC Russian made different coverage actually of that situation. Different not in terms of BBC standards, it was the same, which, which I respect a lot, but it was different in terms of approaching our audience and that's why I'm speaking about 
the audience again. Because as we know that Ukrainian audience is pretty well with all of the details, it doesn't need the explanations of the stages of the conflict because we know what's going on. I mean, they know. And Russian audience, for Russian audience, it is quite far away. Right? Russian audience exists in very different conditions, let's say. They exist sometimes in a quite hostile media environment, if I can use such terms. And they have very less possibility to verify information. And they have very less desire to do it because people have a strong filter, let's say, of Russian media who doesn't which doesn't allow them actually to be more, more, to have more knowledge in that situation. That is why BBC Russian wrote a long feature explaining actually what are Ukrainian tanks doing in Avdivka. And they had that headline, which was totally, well, quite unacceptable, let's say, if it would be for Ukrainian audience, because Ukrainian audience knows what, what is going on, and Russian audience doesn't. So they had to put that headline, and then they explain step by step the stages of the conflict, what is going on, what is the background. And also, they used user-verified content. How did they do it? Well, since I was a disc editor of BBC Ukraine, they sent me the text. I just asked politely. My colleagues did it, which I appreciate very much. And I suggested that, you know, if we are speaking about Ukrainian tanks here and we use the screens on Facebook, made by Ms. Zaharova. We can as well use the user-generated content from YouTube, where people from Donetsk post how the rebels controlled positions um, sh being shooting Ukrainian positions, and they even make those prescriptions that look Banderevci, well, that is for you. Of course, for us, it is very difficult to verify, but we found, we, we checked out those people who from which accounts that video was posted. We checked out when those people were registered, we checked out the history of their posts, and when we found similar, some similar, uh, several similar posts, we could understand that they're probably, yes, they were made, uh, that video shoots were made from different angles, but they are showing the same situation, so we can assume that that event was really happening in that region. And that's why we just link to our material that, and we stated that although there are posts on YouTube from users, which of course we cannot be 100% sure, so we put that disclaimer. But as we checked out, you can see that they are shooting on Ukrainian positions. So, yeah. Thank you, Mona, for uh, a very interesting explanation of what you actually do and how you engage with the audiences. Uh, Nick, getting back to you, have you faced similar issues with user-generated content, verifying data in your work? Of course, all the time. I just want to also add to this, you know, uh, the original question was how to engage with the audience. How do you engage with the audiences? And I think the uh, really, really brief uh, point, uh, there was a Jeff Bezos memo, you know, the top Amazon guy uh, a few days ago. I strongly encourage you to read this. Uh, and in the, in the very beginning, he explains uh, something about high standards. That high standards, they're, they're like a bunch of things about high standards, but perhaps the most important that they're like tough. It's tough to set them up, tough to figure out, uh, tough to make everyone adhere. Uh, and I think the, the most important thing about uh, engagement with the audience is being first sincere and then keeping, uh, first man, uh, creating and then maintaining these high standards. Uh, for us, it means uh, like a bunch of different things we're looking at when we're posting. And uh, we put a lot of time and effort in uh, many of our posts, and that's perhaps why we have a very huge, uh, very big engagement for each post. But getting back to uh, the question about false news UGC content, yeah, you have to be like really careful with whatever's posted there. Uh, I think a lot of you might have seen this uh, video by BuzzFeed recently, and it, it was like a couple of. Uh, weeks and months, uh, there was something similar where Obama says something that he never said. And we're going to see that this, uh, this types of things more and more often in the future. So it's going to make uh, work of journalists uh, even more difficult. So yeah, I mean, if uh, you, you, must have, uh, you must have very high standards for this. And you must, uh, if, if, you're, uh, if you're trying to use uh, UGC 
photo or something, you have to either independently confirm it or reach out to the person and again try to independently confirm it. But this is like very again a huge topic, and uh, I, I just stop right there to uh, to, to but save. Can time. you actually give some suggestions of tools? or trends or insights that you know social activists, NGOs, people in the audience can can use that you are using in digital uh, social media? Well, again, this is a huge topic, but uh, I think my mm, two uh, biggest advice here. First, use your common sense. I mean, like, if something re looks really cheesy, uh, it probably is. And second question, question all. Uh, again, it might, might be it might sound banal for a lot of you, but I see oftentimes, I don't know if it's because the media is such a biased thing, like some media outlets, uh, that they could, you know, they could quote anonymous uh, Telegram channel and say they've been provided without any commentary or explanation. And this is obviously not how it's supposed to work. Uh, with regards to tools, uh, there is a bunch of different techniques uh, for, you know, like geolocation of uh, objects on pictures. Uh, if you, if you, if you uh, say, for instance, if you're looking at YouTube video, you should try. There are tools for that. You, you can just like Google them uh, to. Uh, make screenshots of the video and also do image search for, for these images. Uh, but again, I mean, like, it takes time. So uh, you, you need qualified people and you need time to double check that. And this is the big problem with fighting fake news because it's very easy to create something that's fake and it's very difficult to prove that it's fake. So uh, just, just invest time in, in, into this. And uh, as you invest time, your skills will grow. And also, if I can pick up, uh, also find out about some examples. Of course, according to tools, there are quite, quite a lot more than tools. Like you can do shadow analysis of pictures and on video, and you can use SunCalc if you know such websites. SunCalc, uh, just put it in Google, and you will find it. And it allows you to to see to put the concrete time when this picture was made, and to see in what position was sun, and then you can you can see how shadows could be light on the ground and you compare with the picture so if you see that uh, shadows are not in right position so probably the, it was Photoshop although maybe a good Photoshop but yeah still it was not true the same with video you can use it also but uh, there are much more simple tools just ask questions just ask that person who posted just approach it because many media little media they quite often make a, a little mistake but it's quite common they just repost and then on a certain stage you can find out that actually something was not true yeah absolutely yeah and if you just approach that person who posted it and just ask extra, extra questions i mean it can be anything how old are you what were you doing in that in that particular moment what did you see around you and then you find out that maybe that person actually didn't take that picture or maybe it was somebody else, or maybe he can say, oh, it was actually my friend, you know, and, and I just posted it. And it was two yeah. years ago. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And we had such a funny situation with, where it's just a very simple example and very funny. There was a video in Ukraine on Facebook about two dogs which were lying on the rails, and the train was going about them. It was a very touching video, and it, it had lots of shares, and many Ukrainian media just, of course, we saw it, and we, we wrote to the author trying to approach him, but he didn't respond. At that time, most of Ukrainian media just reposted that post and made like a little article about, oh, how lovely dogs, it's a dog's love, you know, dogs are better than humans, because they didn't, uh, didn't leave each other and they were staying because one, one dog was wounded and, you know, the other one, they saw it, they portrayed it as a dog's love. We were still waiting. It, it really, it really <laughs> um, got us to mobilize our nerves because, of, of course, every journalist wants to make it more quickly, but we were waiting for the response of that person. And when we finally approached him and asked, just asked additional question, it, we found out that actually it was not dog's love. The dogs were a brother and a sister. And actually that they were just, they, no, lots of people were looking for them, but they couldn't find them. And due to the post of that gentleman, their real, well, uh, well they, they just were found. And uh, he told us a much 
longer story and we got extra photos also an extra video and we wrote a totally different article and it has it, it was actually shared by lots of media english uh, our uh, british colleagues also t took it and they made it in english and then it was uh, shared also by english-speaking media and mm -hmm. I, I guess cnn also shared it and yeah and but it was really a different story and it was a good story it was not just a piece of something which is with a bit of twisted facts it was a good real touching story which was shared w w world widely and just because we asked additional questions so yeah, yeah. I, I just wanted to concur. I think uh, one of the most important things, and it's really, as you said, it's really difficult to, you know, like see how everybody just gets, you know, like tons of views on some video that you cannot confirm. Oftentimes, like numerous times in my career, I've seen, you know, like, oh my God, this is like, this guy is wrong, this guy is right, this is so obvious. And then you wait and, you know, like some different details emerge when you reach out to people, when you get extra details. So. Uh, my big, um, well, suggestion to media and also to all of you, just be, if you see something that looks looks weird or not, not like looks super uh, strange oftentimes, well, maybe it is, maybe it's twist, maybe it's fake news. So just like do uh, sometimes like a really, really quick Google search could, uh, could help it. So just don't fall into the easy way of liking or sharing stuff that that looks strange so you can even Olga, if it docks <laughs> you can Olga gave an excellent suggestion to ask questions so i'm gonna ask them my last question and then we're gonna open up for q a so if, if you have questions please prepare them and my last question would be uh maybe a bit controversial so um what do you think about the statement that digital media or media in general uh, should no longer be just news sources, but they should also be change makers? Can we cooperate with NGOs and, and promote certain values, or is it something that is completely alien to the digital cultural digital media? Well, it's a very tempting theme because, of course, when you're a journalist, you want people who are journalists there uh, always quite active and quite often those people become change makers but um, in BBC we have a rule that we don't change the world we, ch we check facts and then allow our audience to make their opinions we cannot well but still of course we work with activists but we work with them not in terms of collaboration of well let's decide to organize an event and then cover it together no of course not we but we can ask them for comments, we can ask their opinion, and that is the main thing. And, and also, for instance, uh, we, we have such a, we make some such topics like reality check also, and we, uh, we double check what activists also say, of course. We, we can like them, but still we have to, to do that checking. And with, with that topics uh, we call reality check, um, we usually put a statement, for instance, of some officials and then go for what, what activists said about that and what documents say about that. And it, ex it takes quite often a long time to, to make this feature together. It is not immediate, but still it's worth of that. And um, yeah, and of course we, we cannot we cannot cross that line because since you become an activist you are not able to be unbiased and it is a huge challenge especially for me it was a huge challenge when i was a ukrainian journalist because you know what is going in your country you are passionate about it you you want to put emotions in it and it is obvious because you know when your family is affected you will not be unbiased you you are in this situation and it's quite difficult to be distant but unfortunately you must do it because since you are involved emotionally it is very easy to to lose the line and to cross it and then your information will not be credible because you become a part of the conflict so you cannot be the journalist anymore Thank yeah you. i Absolutely. There, there should be a very distinct line between journalism and activism. Though, I mean, 
let's let's be realistic. Our reporting changes the world. I mean, even if we just report about something, that oftentimes could create huge impact. Uh, so I think there should well, and I mean, like we as current time, we work closely with NGOs and activists as a source for news. But also, I mean, there is a there is a way of different meaningful collaboration. And uh, by the way, I also invite you all if you if you have some great stories and wanna wanna make like millions of people literally uh, hear and see them just drop by and let me know and we'll figure something out. Uh, a great example. And write to me as well. <laughs> <laughs> there was we'll do the different angles. That was a great example last year uh, where we did, uh, typically uh, how it works, you know, like people would like to, after we do something, some story and get it gets viral, some people are willing to help. People are really, really open and emotional about some, some heroes we uh, do uh, stories about. But as a journalist, we cannot really participate in that. So one uh, great example we had last year, it was, uh, it was about a guy who lives in a, a city of blind, we call it. It's uh, not so far from Moscow, in, uh, near Kaluga. Uh, and the guy, he was living in a very, very uh, dirty and old uh, communal flat that he was sharing with some alcoholic. And, but the guy, he was like so bright person. Uh, and people after watching our video, uh, they, they were just like bombarding uh, us and our partners who, who were sharing the video that uh, we wanna help. And uh, it ended up that a local NGO uh, a fund picked up the idea, they created, a, they created a special account where people could send money and it, it ended up, uh, they gathered a, a lot of money to buy this person, this blind person, uh, Sergey, a separate flat. So and it was, uh, it was this amazing impact. And for for us journalists, it's also you know like very heartwarming because we cannot really participate in that, but you kind of like feeling that you were part of something bigger. And again, if if you have any ideas or, or thoughts on this, uh, let's let's talk. Thanks. And I also think that the perfect example of collaboration, such collaboration between activists and journalists were these stories with Panama Papers and Paradise Papers. When somebody, we don't know who, somebody just made that great leak of documents to journalists. And then journalists just started to check everything and to make links through different governments and several days ago there was a huge investigation of BBC Panorama who, who uncovered the links of Ukrainians, some Ukrainian officials and Mira of Odessa to the properties in London, hidden through offshores. So it was also a part of collaboration between BBC, OCCRP, which is a different media organization, so see we are not competitors, we are colleagues and we, are, we, must, we must work in, in this environment and, because we are making a common job. And the activists who actually made that link possible, that leak possible, because without it, I cannot imagine actually how it would be possible to get that information. So, yeah. Thank you, Nick, and thank you, Olga. And now I think we will open up for questions from the audience. Do we have any? Okay, I see one, two, okay. So there was one question in the, in the first row, and another gentleman there. Yeah, I think we will go question by question. I think it's, it's easier for you, or do you want to? Absolutely, wanna... yeah, yeah, let's. Okay, let's so let's, let's start. Yeah, uh, my question is that uh, you said that to produce the news, you need to check the facts, a lot of resources, and if it's true or not. So what is your perception of the how to deal with the fake news? Because for fake news production, you just make need to find a video or picture and to create the text and it's much more easy and faster and it's more believable even than, than the real news thank you so who wants Sometimes. to take it well i i can jump in uh this is a great question and uh, and a, absolutely a topic for a separate panel uh, to me there are twofold th uh, the, the answer is twofold first uh the organizations should devote more time and effort to debunk the stories 
Uh, and the other part, which is maybe something that not media but uh, NGOs and activists could do, uh, it's to inform the audience, basically. Again, like, don't share things that look cheesy. Uh, be aware of what's going on. Uh, try to... Uh, try to simply, uh, you know, like Google some some things, and you'll figure out it's fake. But it's a it's a great topic, and it's a very complex uh, complex thing. Well, it depends on the fake, and well, for for big media, you have to plan your resources all the time, and you cannot, well, debunk everything which you said by let's say Kremlin's propaganda or Korean propaganda or Chinese propaganda. But of course, with the main stories, we do it and we do it very precisely. We have that stuff, as I told before, the reality check format. It's a kind of format. We call it reality check for English speaking audience. And if for Russian speaking audience, it is fact checking uh, or the проверка um, фактов. And uh, for instance, we did it when uh, Nibeza was speaking with uh, the uh, representative of Great Britain in the Security Council phone, uh, UN, I apologize. And um, uh, when, when there were allegations from Russia to Great Britain that Great Britain did not follow the Convention of Chemical Weapons, and we did it really precisely. So we took a phrase and we analyzed. Because sometimes, you know, the technique of propaganda is, uh, well, there are lots of tools, and I will not stop on that because, as Nick told, it's a really other topic for discussion. Um, and quite big one, but uh, one of the tools is that in one phrase, phrase there can be combined several parts, let's say. One part can be true, the other part can be true, and the, other, the third part can be not true. And then when it is united in the one sentence, it creates a total another reality. So to debunk it, we, we just put the phrase and then we start step by step uncovering the parts of that phrase. But it takes really time. So, so to write such a feature, it probably takes for journalists a, a day. It is not possible to do it immediately. What we can do immediately is we, we can put the comments of the activists or experts or let's say somebody with a high credibility to say the other point of view. But then we will write the long feature debunking step by step what was said. And it, it also depends on the story. So it was, of course, if it was just put online and said without any video, without any photos, it will be probably text more with some elements of visualization, maybe with some graphics. We use digital um, data and, well, charts. They also help interactive charts as well. Um, or when it was said on video, you can, you can make the whole video package it depends on the resonance, on the story, on, on the platform on which it was made. Yeah. Next one. There was a second question. Hello, Filip Kojembiewski, Institute for Discourse and Dialogue. I would like to ask two questions. Uh, do you consider fake news as a biggest threat for the democracy and uh, public debate nowadays, or are there some other equivalent phenomena that are the threats for the democracy uh, nowadays. And the second one, um, what is, in your opinion, the best way to fight against fake news besides the fact-checking? Because you said about fact-checking, it's, it's kind of obvious way to fight against the, the fake news. But what are some other solutions that you uh, um, suggest? Do you suggest some uh, legal solutions in the law system or maybe some other way of sanctioning? Thank you. I, I would just start answering from the, from the very last question. In Russia, they are now proposing a law uh, against fake news. Uh, but I, I don't know how it's supposed to be working. Uh, real quick, first, uh, Fake news is a big threat, but it's been there for quite a while, and now it's just like technology that's uh, making making it very easy and fast to spread. So I guess that's why uh, I don't know if it's the biggest threat to democracy, but it's quite a threat. Uh, if, you know, if people could get uh, disinformized that quickly. Uh, second thing, how to fight? Uh, as I said. Education, besides fact-checking, education of people, uh, also, yeah, also some legal procedures, 
probably as well. And also like fighting this, you know, like bot troll farms or whatever, like the this organization that produced news. And I think the platforms, uh, Facebook, they, they had a, quite a bunch of initiatives on that. And we'll see if, if they're going to be uh, successful. Well, what do you suggest? <laughs> do you have an answer? Because there are lots of discussions on this topic and of course it is not possible to tackle it with only one solution. I agree totally about the education because the edu education of audience is of high importance. You, you, you just, every, probably all of you know that if you see something you will just Google it again at least to see it on a different source. But would our parents do it? I don't know. Absolutely, absolutely. And would our kids do it? It depends on us. So we can, we can impact on education about that. We can talk about it. That's why we're here today, right? And also, legislation. Well, with legislation, it's a bit difficult uh, because different countries have different legislation. And I think it would help a lot if there would be more international legislation. But it is my opinion, not the BBC's, as you understand. <laughs> probably, uh, if there would be a more unite, unity in the legislation of different countries. Because with some stories, like it was, for instance, with the recent investigation of BBC Panorama, as I mentioned, we had to show it to British lawyers, then to Russian lawyers, then to Ukrainian lawyers. Then after, the, after the, that investigation, you would, well, you can assume that lots of facts were just could, could not put on air and could not put anywhere because there could be courts against BBC. So we are really precise with that, but do the officials are that precise as well? Because during that investigation, one of BBC journalists was beaten, actually. He was beaten when he just tried to ask a question. Will there be any punishment for those who, will there just ever be found those people who did it? Well, that's a good question. So, of course, we demand more, and as journalists, I think, and as the civil society, we must, we must demand more strict um, amplification of the legislation. So, probably the laws are quite good, but we must imply them. And since they are not implied, since the cases are lying in the courts, not finished, we, we cannot do anything, but we can, do, we can be more active about talking about that. We as a journalist about reporting about that, and you as activists about putting pressure on government and make them more accountable about those cases. Thank you. Thank you, Olga, and thank you, Nick. We have time for one more quick question. Is there anybody dying to ask something question, from the audience? Quick answer, yeah. Anyone? Over yeah. there. Um, is there a mic? I just have a quick question about uh, debunking uh, fake news. If this is actually uh, uh, bringing any positive results, I mean, if it's really effective, because if you go out on the street and ask people, uh, do you visit websites like Stop Fake or, or, or any, anything of that sort, uh, they would probably say no. So, so is, is the banking really doing the job? And, and if not, what, what are the alternatives to, 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 to make people aware that the, these are the fake news? Well, I think uh, that, that's actually a great question and great point. Uh, people would not, you know, like specifically search for, you know, like, hey, debunk this. Well, but sometimes these websites are really helpful. When you Google something and it just, you know, like pops up first, you know, like stop fake or whatever, uh, or polygraph or fact check or whatnot. Uh, I, as I said, it's just like one part of the solution, and this is this is like the whole of puzzle. So. Uh, it cannot just be uh, one site or like one initiative. People has to be aware of that that it's happening and that uh, media are are doing that. And but also, I mean, like if if big media writes a big story about like debunking something, then then it's going to be hurt. Yeah. Okay. Well, I really regret that there is no colleague from Deutsche Welle today because I think he, she could uh, speak more about German media because there was a huge, huge story when, which was really a fake, when, as it was portrayed by propagandistic media, uh, 
a girl was raped by refugees. And um, then German media found out that it was actually a fake, and German media uh, proceeded a case against that media which, which first launched it. I don't know what, what was actually the result of that, of that case, was anybody punished, but it was a good pre precedent that it is possible to do it and that we should act in such way. But still, I think that uh, those well, as you mentioned, it, it really requires lots of efforts really to debunk and people would not probably search themselves. But if such projects are in collaboration with the big media, as Nick mentioned, not as local or maybe like uh, with a tiny audience, it can make effect. It, it really can have effect. And so that is the question about the audience you have. And that is a question about engaging audience again. So you must think how to engage your audience to come to you. And yeah, that is, that is where, where we are crossing the line and going to another field again. Yeah. I think we need to focus uh, one of the sessions next year on fake news or even earlier than that, <laughs> that it gets too much, uh, that much interest. Thank you all. Thank you, Nick. Thank you, Olga. Thank you all for... Uh attending this discussion and being so active. So if I can wrap up really quickly, uh, what Olga and Nick were saying is just ask questions, engage with your audience, look what works for them, and just use your common sense, you know, when working with data, when working with news, and when working with NGOs. Thank you very much for, for coming, uh, and have a great rest of the conference. Thank you.